Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, guys. Uh, thank you for coming to the final committee meeting for the uh, Johnny Cake Elementary School Capacity Relief Study. Um, it's been a long, long process. You guys have done a lot of good work leading up to this final night where we're, um, we're looking for you to make a recommendation to be presented to the school board. So a little review of the agenda. We have the public information session uh, prior, uh, in between the last meeting and this meeting. So we're going to review some of that, uh, that, that information session, uh, those results. We're going to break you guys into some small groups and have you uh, do a little bit of uh, deliberation on the, on the recommendation and a little exercise for that. And then uh, as you work towards a recommendation, and then we'll let you go home. So um, looking at the calendar, you could see that uh, here we are at our last meeting. Uh, we've met, uh, started in January, this process, and here we are in April, uh, in the beginning of uh, the good weather starting to show up. And we'll be, uh, after this, the at the recommendation is made and finalized, we will be uh, presenting this to the board on May the 7th. And um, then the board will have a public hearing on May 15th to uh, hear out the public and hear any other comments the public may have. And then the board is expected to vote on June the 11th. I want to review the objectives uh, just as a, a recap on some of these. We've covered these a lot in the, throughout the process. But the community-based comprehensive, comprehensive boundary study is tasked with meeting these following objectives. To provide capacity relief to Johnny Cake Elementary School, to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize the capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. Are, there are rules to follow, and these are uh, the considerations uh, per Rule 1280, which is established by the school board, and these help you identify uh, which of the options best, best uh, should you recommend based on the, the option that best adheres to these considerations as a whole. And these include maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, Look at the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, and that certainly applies in this, in this process and some of the work that we've been doing. And minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned. Efficient use of capacity in affected schools. Long-term enrollment, capacity trends, and future capital plans. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. Phasing in boundary changes by, all, uh, by grade level for high schools, which doesn't apply here because we're focusing only on elementary. Uh, this process is, is not, in, it not going to impact any middle or high school students in this process. And additional things to consider is use of geographic features such as railroads, creeks, major highways, and, um, and, and, that, and that applies here too because we've been talking about Ingleside being a major road that sort of divides the area and you've looked at options on both sides of Ingleside whether it's crossing over or you have options that you've created that have it on one side of Ingleside to minimize the number of times kids have to cross over there. Because currently there's a big population of Johnny Cake that, that crosses over Ingleside, and so you've developed options to, to minimize that, that component, for example. So we had a public information session. It was held on February 27th to gather feedback from the community on options. Uh, we had an online survey to help uh, that accompanied that to invite the public to participate and give input on. Um, 17 total respondents participated in the online survey, um, which isn't s too surprising because if you look at what you've been doing, you've been focusing on minimal impact to try to solve the, solve the problem and accomplish your objectives. And, and because of that, there's a, few, a small number of people who are impacted, children who are impacted, so I, I'm not surprised to see um, that, there, that there hasn't been a, a larger um, uh, participation from the overall public as it relates to the, some of the work that you've been doing. Remember, when you look at the, the survey information, to, to utilize this as just an additional piece of information, it's really important to focus on all the statistics and all the data and focus on the objectives and the best recommendation is going to be one that adheres to, uh, adheres to that, those criteria, those rules, as, as best as possible. 
So don't focus on the results of the survey as the sole basis for determining which one you think should, should be recommended or not. Um, you all should have picked up a packet of information when you walked in that had the survey results at the back end of that as, as well. So the public was asked their overall opinion towards an option, and options one and three received the most strongly in favor of votes. Option two received the most responses for strongly opposed, and options one and four received the, the most somewhat in favor votes. And uh, you can see down here how that breaks down, and, and we asked the, the public what their attitude was towards an option, um, and this is, how, this is how it broke down per, per option. The primary reasons for supporting options were that it addresses current overcrowding and maintains neighborhood continuity. So, um, so you'll see that for option one, five, five of the respondents uh, said that they liked that because it addressed current overcrowding. And you could see it, 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 it uh, across the board, there was relief provided, and so, they, so that was what they had, uh, the, the feedback that they had provided uh, for the most part. We asked them, uh, those who were opposed to an option, what was the reason and the rationale? And um, the primary concern was it does not address the current overcrowding. So, and so some people uh, felt like uh, it, it wasn't enough in some cases. And again, uh, be mindful that you know we're we're looking at 17 respondents and not not a, a large sample here size of respondents for uh, for the um, as it relates to this feedback. And other concerns, whether it does not, does not address long-term enrollment needs, and so both of the concerns were really related around utilization and, um, uh, and enrollment for, particularly for Johnny Cake uh, Elementary School. So I'm going to review the options, um, the advantages and limitations, and I'm just going to recap these. These are what we discussed at the public information session and also some, some of the information that we created um, uh, and, and worked on at the, at the last committee meeting. So looking at option one, you can see in option one, uh, this is Ingleside right here, and you can see this section right here is Johnny Cake currently. The blue outline represents the current Johnny Cake elementary zone. And this area was moved into Edmondson Heights. Um, the, the advantages of option one is that it brings Johnny Cake utilization below 100%. Um, this area that we've been looking at, that you've been looking at moving one way or the other, it's all walkable to both schools. And so that's, that's an advantage that you'll see across, across the board. Um, but this also, another advantage is that students in this option, they don't have to cross Ingleside in this, this block, these blocks and they can walk to Edmondson Heights without having to cross over Ingleside. And you've made some variations of this map as, uh, as, you, as the process matured. Um, limitations that Edmondson, Edmondson Heights is right at 100% utilization in the option, and so it's, it's sitting right at 100%, and it does impact the most students of all, of all the draft options. Option two looks different in that it's instead of coming, uh, keeping on the south side of Ingleside here, we took a block um, in just on north of Ingleside and sent that to Edmondson Heights. So this, this option moves the fewest number of students among the four options, and all, but all students um, uh, who, are, who are moved can still walk to school, which I said is sort of a, con uh, a uh, you see that in all the options. And the limitations is Johnny Cake is still over 100% in this particular option. <laughs> option three, instead of taking things more on one side or the other of Ingleside, this option just moved the, the Edmondson Heights boundary further, cl closer to Johnny Cake, a, down a couple of blocks. Um, advantages of this option is that Edmondson Heights uh, zone remains compact by just moving two blocks further south. Um, it moves the second fewest of all four draft options, and then all students who are moved can still walk to school, like all options. A limitation is that it's, it doesn't provide enough relief to give Johnny Cake below 100%, although Johnny Cake does get relief. Uh, it doesn't bring them below 100% utilization. 
And option four, which is an option that you had crafted, I think after the third meeting or the second meeting, probably I think it was the third meeting, um, has a similar look as option one, but you took a little bit of the south area off and you kept that at Johnny Cake because of the proximity to Johnny Cake, but you still moved these two, these two or three blocks to Edmonton Heights, and you also moved just a, the, the south, moved down just one street here to provide a little bit more relief to Edmonton Heights. So uh, some advantages of this is that it does provide the best balance of utilization. Both schools are actually 100, uh, below 100% in this particular option, which is, um, the, uh, which is the only option that does do that. Um, kids can still walk to school and, and because we're working within walkable areas in this option. Uh, the limitations is that it moves the second most students of the four options. But as you can see, sometimes that's necessary to bring the balance and uh, ad adhere to our objectives and, and rules. Does anybody have any questions? Do they want to make any comments about the four options? And the next, the next part of the, the tonight, we're going to have you guys work in some small groups and just start to look, uh, look through the options and study the numbers and just sort of uh, refresh your memory before you make a recommendation. Does anybody have any comments or anything like that about the public input or any of the four options before we let you guys break into small groups? Okay, so um, what do you think? Do you want to do one group or would you guys like to do two small, two small groups? You guys, you guys think one group is good for, this, for a group of this size? Okay, so we'll just have you guys do work in one group and what we'd like you to do is, um, is review all the options. It should be noted that any of the four options have not been modified since the public information session, so you're looking at them just as they were presented to the public. Um, take a look at the survey results, look at the, some of the comments, um, and because we do have the raw comments in the back there, and they're sorted by, uh, you can see how each option comments for each option, and then the, uh, where, they, where they, uh, they live. So people from Johnny Cake and Edmondson Heights provided feedback. Um, We'd like you to list the pros and cons of the options. So you should have a sheet of paper on there that you see has the, the, the strengths and weaknesses that's listed. So feel free to do that as a, as a tool to help you, um, help you determine which one you feel should be the recommendation if you feel it's necessary. Um, the principals will act as facilitators and recorders in this process. So they can, they can, they can be there and they can help uh, be in the conversation but uh, principals are non-voting members in this process, and so the principals can't vote on a recommendation. Um, and we're gonna give you some time. We have thir 30 minutes, we've given you 30 minutes, but if you need more time uh, or less time, we'll certainly um, do that. So if, if you look like you're wrapping up sooner, then we'll, um, we'll regroup, and I'll just sort of guide, like get a feel for how you, with the progress you guys are making. When you're doing this, as you're talking through your groups, I'll leave this slide up, but, um, Review the objectives and considerations. So how do the options support the boundary study objectives and considerations? Which one best adheres to these considerations as a whole? Look at the number, the maps, but also look at the numbers as you work through this. Um, consider future projected enrollment, which is something that we had provided to you. It's, it should be in your, in your packet of information from prior meetings in your, uh, in your binders. And I had one more slide on this, uh, to just a note that, uh, that, well, I'll cover that next after we get done with your small groups. Do you guys have any questions about the small group uh, exercise? Okay, well, I'll let you get to it, and I'll sort of uh, be here if you guys have any questions.
as committee members kind of gave me the thumbs up like you guys were ready to, to move to the recommendation steps here in this process. Um, just going to talk a little bit about uh, the nomination and voting considerations. So uh, uh, principals do not vote and the committee will recommend one scenario um, and the Board of Education does have access to all the information. So even though you're bringing forth one recommendation, um, the, the Board of Ed will do their homework and study all the work, the body of work that you guys had done leading up to this and um, consider the study goals in Rule, rule 1280, like I've been saying. Before we get into the voting part of this process, does anybody uh, uh, want to share any of your thoughts that you guys had as small groups or any, anybody want to provide any input or feedback as a result of some of your conversations? Um, we did notice that although it's reported that um, the, the public liked options one and three most got the most strongly in favor votes, that if you lump together strongly in favor and somewhat in favor, and we'll call that generally in favor, that option four does as well as option three. And option four is a, an option that the entire group kind of likes. So we felt good about that in that we're not ignoring public opinion. Um, we're, we are leaning toward an option that is as valid or all, sort of also approved by the public or at the same level. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's a, a valid point. So I, I like to, to look that. at those two top two as well and lump them together to see. Yeah. It's a, they're both positive responses. So. And we also noticed that for option two, um, which is an option that we liked the least and have talked the least about, um, it also seemed like the public was the least interested in that. Because if you lump together somewhat opposed and strongly opposed, you came up with more than 50%. It was a pretty high number. So we felt like we were also having our feelings validated by the public as that not being the best option. So, yes, ma'am. It's good observations. Anybody else want to share any thoughts or any feedback? Okay. So um, let me see here. So voting will be done using these ActiVote devices. So I think everybody has received um, their clicker and they have their, all the voting members have their ActiVote device. Um, what we're gonna do is we have two rounds to, uh, of voting. If, if the first round does not uh, bring us to a, a clear recommendation, we will use the, we'll do two rounds of voting to get down to, um, to, so that you can narrow it down before you make your final vote for recommending. So the first vote will be used to reduce the options to two, and then the two options that receive the highest votes will, be, will then be advanced to the final vote. And then you'll do another, and you can discuss those two options, and then a final vote will, um, will be on those two options. And we'll see how the votes land and, and determine if we need to have two options or not. So um, we're bringing up the, uh, the clickers, and so, I'm going to talk a little bit about the question here and the, before you guys vote. So what we want you to answer is um, the option I vote to recommend to the Board of Education is option one, two, three, or four. And you can see option one is A, two is B, three is C, and option four, you would click op the, D op the D on your clicker to choose which one you want to do. Anybody have any questions about that? So if you're ready, you can go ahead and choose, and we can see how, how people have voted. So we have, we have all, all of the voting members have uh, cast their vote. And let's see what the options, uh, what the results show. So the results, <laughs> with, with a smaller group like this, it's, yeah. You guys, so it's unanimous that option four is what the, the committee feels is the recommendation. Um, and I, you know, I got to say, I'm just, I'm really proud of you guys as a group and working as a team and a, a cohesive unit. This is never easy and moving students and moving and impacting families. And I'm really, really impressed with the dynamic that you guys brought to the table and working together and, and developing a plan, a solution that helps both schools and helps benefit all children in this district. So, so you guys did a great job and I, I really, and I speak on behalf of the district, we really appreciate um, your, your efforts in this. Um, I'm going to do a few wrap-up, uh, just a wrap-up slide here. 
and, uh, and then we'll let you guys go home. So let's see here. Can I oh, make one more yeah, comment? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing that a lot of the comments refer back to is, um, and I feel like it's really important that some people did come out to this meeting and they had things to say. And some of the things that the community is saying is, none of these are going to really alleviate the capacity issues because we're still going to be at 98 and 99% or you know very close to that. And that what happens on the ground is that the numbers are often higher than that. So there's, there's that issue. Um, and the other thing that gets mentioned a lot, um, both here and both just from knowledge of the Southwest area, is that the, the conditions of these buildings is not great. And so I know that the goal of us being here today was to do the best we can with this process. And I feel like we have done that. Um, but I feel like more attention needs to be paid to building conditions for these kids in these schools because when the schools are this overcrowded, it's hard for the kids to actually learn and do the jobs they need to do. And also what we have in that area is a population of people who, when one family moves out, um, multiple families will move into a house. So even though there aren't capital planning projects in the area or developments in the area that are on county records, we have multiple families living in houses where, that are just called single family homes and those numbers are projected as if they'll have you know, 1.7 or whatever kids going to school there, whereas that might not be the reality. So I think that the county might need to spend a little time reflecting on how those populations can be better represented in numbers so that the schools are actually at these capacities because 99% is fine if that's what they're really going to be at but it seems like these are the numbers that we get but it's not what happens in reality a lot of times so we we offer this option as a disclaimer it's the best we can do but if we had a budget <laughs> we would budget for a new building you know we would right. budget to plan for better for these kids who are crammed into these classrooms and me as a taxpayer I would rather these kids have a better building than my kindergartner have a laptop. That's all I have to say. Yeah, and you know, you're right. You, you have limited, you are constrained to work within a, a, a universe, and that is, you know, looking at boundaries and things like that. But, um, and like I said, I mean, I think we're doing the best we can with what we have here. But, you know, I'm a volunteer. Like, I've been here at every meeting on my own time, doing something that I think is important. But, you know, I want the money to, I want the, the school system, the county, to prioritize things like this, you know, buildings that are falling down or overcrowded or, or just have too many kids in a classroom. You know, that's where our money should be spent. So that's why I'm here. Yes, ma'am. And, I, you know, I, I appreciate that, that feedback, and I know the school district does too. Um, I, what I would say is um, you've done a great job as well as all the committee members to focus on your tasks and, and, and accomplish your objectives for this process. But um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can't go to the um, Board of Education and speak in, about, about your thoughts outside of what your, your realms are. And that's good. It's, it's, it's good to voice your opinion um, because as a taxpayer and as a, as a citizen of this county, um, you know, they want to hear, the board wants to hear what you have to say. And, um, so I think that it's, you know, you're, you're welcome at the, even at the public hearing or at the presentation, you can sign up to speak and uh, you could speak, you know, you've done work as a committee member, but you can always go there and speak as a taxpayer and as a citizen and share some of your thoughts that are, that sort of things that you couldn't control that we didn't have the flexibility of working with new space or things that you can, other opinions you can voice to the board and, uh, and try to extend that conversation. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I just wanted to make a comment on uh, the process from here. Uh, on the, one of our first slides that we looked at shows that the uh, Board of Education will consider and make a decision on June 11th. And I was wondering if there was uh, any, if the process included uh, a way to, to, to take into consideration uh, the pre-kindergarten and kindergarten and even the first grade students that will be enrolling in, uh, uh, in the future. Uh, particularly next year. I know at uh, Johnny Cake, for example, we just uh, just yesterday had an event to encourage 
right, and to welcome uh, some new pre-K and kindergarten students. Uh, those parents were most likely not part of any of the communications that we would have been sending out for the survey and for any of the other outreach to let them know that this is coming. And they're most likely to be the ones that'll be the most directly impacted. Within the next year or two, they'll be the ones either moving or not moving, depending on uh, what happens. So I was just wondering if uh, the decision will be made by June 11th, which is before the next school year. So is there any review or second look at it in September or in October after the new enrollment numbers are in and we have the new pre-kindergarten and kindergarten students here and those parents are now given the opportunity to find out that, oh, you just enrolled in Johnny Cake, but next year you're going to have to go to Edmondson. So, I mean, how does that get to them? Typically, uh, this process, um, the school district needs to make, keep moving ahead so that they can start planning uh, for adjustments in staff and also notifying parents and children. So they, they do look to finalize the process in June with the board, when the board makes a decision. And that once that happens, that then the, the boundary change becomes, whatever the board decides, becomes a permanent uh, a plan and a, and a directive from the Board of Education. Um, the, I would say that uh, what, what you could do if you, felt, if you felt compelled to do so is um, share with, uh, if, you, if you have a, a, a method to reach out to some of those pre-K parents and things like that, if you see them at schools, Keep them informed on what's happening with the process, and you can have them, they can always come speak at the uh, public hearing when the board, because we present this to the board in, um, in May, at the beginning of May, and then in mid-May, the board's going to be here at the auditorium at Woodlawn High School, inviting the parents and public, any member of the public, to come voice their thoughts to the, directly to the board. Um, those, those, mem those members of the public are welcome to do that. Uh, at that time, um, but I'd say that at you know what what I, the long story short is that the process needs to continue and it, and it needs to needs to be finalized so that the the, the staff and the, the the district can start uh, planning for the change that's being recommended here. And to clarify, this boundary change will not be effective for the 1920 school year. It'll be effective for the 2021 school year. So not appropriate notifications will go out to families in the spring, most likely, of, of 2020 for the 2020-2021 school year. And additional communications will go up, go out through the school. The website also, when parents go to look up their boundary addresses, for any affected addresses that are changing, it will have those addresses flagged that says, this is your current boundaries assignments, but starting for the 2021 school year, this is the new address assignment. And yeah, just to, just to recap on that, uh, we will be providing your recommendation to the board on May 7th, uh, the early May, and then the, there's a hearing that's going to be at the auditorium here where uh, members of the public can, um, can come talk to, directly to the board and voice their concerns or uh, thoughts and observations to the board, and then that board will vote on June, and then at, at that point, the, the process is, 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 is comes to a completion. Um, this is the end of your role as in this process as a committee, um, you know, but, uh, and now it goes in the hands of the board, and the board has the flexibility to, to, to do what they want with your recommendation. Um, so you can feel free to come and voice your thoughts as members of the, as, as a, members of the public, like I said, at the, at the public speaking opportunities that the board offers uh, through their process. Um, but you don't have to attend the recommendation or the public hearings, it's not mandatory for you. You guys have done a lot of work and dedicated a lot of your time as volunteers, and we really appreciate that. Um, so with that said, is there any other questions or comments that you guys have before we, we adjourn? Okay, well, thank you all again for all of your hard work, and we really, uh, really appreciate all of your dedication to the school district, and I hope you guys have a good uh, spring, and um, Talk to you soon. Thank you.